Wolf Parkinson White syndrome is due to an accessory atrioventricular pathway which bypasses the normal atrioventricular nodal delay. ECG manifests a short PRN level and a delta wave. They are prone for supraventricular tachycardias due to re-entry mechanisms. This means that signal passing down the abnormal pathway travels back along the normal pathway or vice versa to produce a circus movement producing an oscillation of electrical signals within the heart. There are at least 10 different locations of the accessory pathway around the mitral and tricuspid valve annulus. Each pathway gives a different manifestation in the routine ECG. The amplitude of the delta wave in each lead helps us to identify the location of the accessory pathway. SVT in WPW syndrome can be orthodromic or antidromic. Orthodromic means the downward conduction of the signal is along the normal pathway while the return signal is along the abnormal pathway. In antidromic, the downward signal is in the abnormal pathway and the return is by the normal pathway. The word dromic means in relation to conduction. Orthodromic tachycardia has a narrow QRS complex and is the commonest variety accounting for 90%. The remaining 10% is antidromic and has a wide QRS because the downward conduction is through the abnormal pathway. In orthodromic tachycardia, the impulse travels down the normal AV pathway into the ventricle and back into the atrium through the accessory pathway. Vice versa occurs in antidromic tachycardia. Antidromic tachycardia is often mistaken for ventricular tachycardia due to the white QRS complex. It may be noted that pre-excitation delta wave does not manifest during orthodromic tachycardia. Hence, a diagnosis of WPW syndrome cannot be made during the tachycardia. An ECG taken after termination of the tachycardia will show the delta wave so that it is mandatory to take an ECG after termination of SVT. SVT in WPW syndrome can be terminated by carotid sinus massage, intravenous adenosine or by intravenous verapamil. Atrial fibrillation can rarely occur in WPW syndrome and can be life-threatening due to high ventricular rates. Ventricular rate is very high because the impulses are transmitted down both normal AV pathway and the accessory pathway. Moreover, the refractory period of accessory pathway decreases with increasing rates permitting rapid conduction. In the normal conduction system, refractory period increases with increasing rate. The ventricle may not be able to track the fast rate and go into ventricular fibrillation. Hence, atrial fibrillation in WPW syndrome requires immediate termination by cardioversion. ECG showing atrial fibrillation in WPW syndrome with fast ventricular rate. QRS is wide and irregular with varying width due to the varying degrees of pre-excitation in each beat. WPW syndrome can be treated medically with antiarrhythmic drugs like amiodarone, but the current day treatment of choice in symptomatic persons with WPW syndrome is radiofrequency catheter ablation of the accessory pathway. This is more important for pathways with lower refractory period as they tend to conduct atrial fibrillation at very fast rates. In radiofrequency catheter ablation, Small electrodes are introduced into various parts of the heart to record electrical signals from the various parts of the heart to locate the site of the abnormal pathway. Once the abnormal pathway has been located, radiofrequency energy is delivered to produce a tiny, highly localized superficial burn which destroys the abnormal pathway. This procedure is done under local anesthesia and the electrodes are introduced through the femoral and jugular veins and occasionally through femoral artery. Fluoroscopic view of electrode catheters used for radiofrequency catheter ablation. Progressive decrease in PR and level with reciprocal increase in QRS width due to changing degree of pre-excitation has been termed concertina effect in WPW syndrome. It may be noted that the PJ interval from the beginning of P wave to the end of the QRS remains constant.
it has been mentioned that those manifesting concertina effect is likely to have higher axillary pathway refractory period. This would translate to lower ventricular rates in case of occurrence of atrial fibrillation and hence lesser chance of sudden cardiac death. WPW syndrome with atrial fibrillation is a potentially life-threatening situation because of the very fast ventricular rates which can lead on to ventricular fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation with fast ventricular rate is encountered in accessory pathways with short refractory periods typically less than 250 milliseconds. Concertina effect has been described during an episode of vasospastic angina in a person with WPW syndrome. In this case, a gradual prolongation of AH interval was documented in the His bundle electrogram. Epstein's anomaly, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and mitral wall prolapse are the important structural heart diseases associated with WPW syndrome. Developmental anomaly of the tricuspid valve is associated with delayed intraatrial conduction, right bundle branch block, and accessory atrioventricular pathways in Epstein's anomaly. In a series of 224 patients, 64 had documented tachycardia. 33 with recurrent tachycardia had a single right-sided axillary pathway which was successfully ablated. Only 21 of the 33 had typical ECG pattern of pre-excitation. An interesting finding was that none had an ECG pattern of right bundle branch block during sinus rhythm. Radiofrequency catheter ablation resulted in the appearance of RBBB in 94% of the patients. Absence of RBBB in patients with Epstein's anomaly with recurrent tachycardia had 98% sensitivity and 92% specificity for the diagnosis of an accessory pathway. An interesting case of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, sinus tachycardia and pulmonary edema has been reported. Coronary angiogram was normal and she was discharged on metoprolol after recovery. One month later, she presented with atrioventricular tachycardia and underwent accessory pathway ablation. Still another two weeks later, she presented with ventricular tachycardia and was given an implantable cardioverter defibrillator. She had all typical complications of hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy which were promptly and successfully treated. About 3% of WPW syndrome can have a familial occurrence. These familial cases have an autosomal dominant mode of inheritance and the genes responsible were first identified by Golob and colleagues who mapped the gene responsible to chromosome 7. The gene which encodes for a protein AMP activated protein kinase was identified as the causal gene PRKAG2. Specifically, it encodes for the gamma 2 subunit which is a non-catalytic subunit of AMPK. These were missense mutations in which a single nucleotide is substituted by another one inducing a change of a single amino acid in the sequence of the final protein which is produced by the action of the gene. Initial cases of familial WPW syndrome also had cardiac hypertrophy. Cardiac conduction disorders are also associated and occur around the fourth decade of life. These conduction abnormalities involve both the AV nodal and the accessory pathway and interestingly they may require a pacemaker in spite of having two pathways for AV conduction. Pathophysiology of PRKAG2 mutation causing familial WPW syndrome resembles that of Pombe's disease in that glycogen-like substance deposition may contribute to cardiac hypertrophy. Some authors have proposed that glycogen deposition disrupts the annulus fibrosis which insulates the atria from the ventricle and is responsible for pre-excitation. BMP2 was another gene which has been linked with WPW syndrome. Bone morphogenic protein is involved in the development of the atrioventricular canal. Microdeletion of 20p12.3 produces pre-excitation along with variable neurocognitive deficits.